Hey, Jake, how's it going? Hi, good. How are you? I'm doing really good. Thanks. Uh, my first question is, who are you and what do you do? Who, are, who am I? Uh, my name is Jake Udy. I live in Seattle. Uh, I was born and raised in Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, for the most part, I'm a writer. Mo and I'm mo mostly I do interviews. Fantastic. Uh, and you do a lot of interviews. Uh, so I want to ask the, the first question you ask in an interview naturally sets a tone for the conversation that's ahead. Um, and I want to ask a question about the first question you often ask, uh, with musicians, especially, I notice you, you'll usually ask something along the lines of what's your first memory of music or when did music become important to you? Uh, so my first question is kind of two parts. One is that first question important and kind of getting into the, the vibe of the interview. And secondly, what do you hope to get out of guests with that recurring question kind of taking them back? Yeah. Um, the first question, the, the idea of the first question being important is a little bit of a tricky one because it's not actually the first thing I say to somebody, you know, it's the mm. first thing that's printed. But when, when I, when I connect on a phone call or something like that, you know, it's, there's a lot of, you know, how you doing, maybe where are you calling from, things like that. So it's important to set the tone, but it, the first question is not necessarily the first tone setter. Um, However, I, I, it's, it's a good job by you to notice that. I do like to ask that because um, I feel like it puts uh, the interviewee, like their, their life flashes before their eyes in a way. They go back and they re remember both uh, why they got into music, um, if I'm interviewing a musician, and they sort of see their whole career from the moment we're talking back all the way to sort of childhood. So it, it presents like a, a good tone. It presents... Um, you know, puts them in their in their mind of a child, which is when they fell in love with something with music and being creative. Um, and so I think it sort of it it puts them in the right mind state. And and I think you know maybe asking something about childhood maybe uh, hopefully engenders some trust in me uh, during the, in the beginning of the conversation. And that's that's sort of crucial, especially because most of the conversations I do are over the phone. I don't even really do Zoom and and not in person, especially now. And, so they don't, people don't even know what I look like unless they sort of, you know, go to my website or something. Um, so I, it, it's, you sort of have to engender trust pretty quickly. And you do that through the questions and through tone of voice and through language choice and through, um, you know, how much research you exhibit. Um, but yeah, so there, there is, there is intentionality and there is, you know, strategy, but um, it's not as crucial as uh, it can be made to seem. Gotcha. Well, on that note, let's go back. Tell me about growing up in New Jersey. I know, <laughs> Uh, like how, how did where you grew up kind of inform yeah who you are and what you're interested in i know your parents really introduced you to a lot of what you're drawn to now kind of uh as food music poetry love of language yeah tell me yeah. more about that yeah uh so i was uh born and raised in princeton new jersey i have i don't know if you can see it i have it tattooed on my arm here the state of new jersey oh, there it is um I was lucky enough, the household I grew up in, uh, I was lucky to be exposed to, um, you know, the positivity of thought. Like my parents wanted me to get good grades. They wanted me to read. They wanted me to sort of study language. My, both my parents were professors, uh, French language professors. Um, my dad was a professor at Princeton, which is why we lived there, Princeton University. And my mom taught at Columbia for a little while. And then later she worked at Princeton. Um, so they were smart and they cared about communication and language and other languages and other cultures. They were, as French professors, you know, we, we were lucky enough to take trips to Europe. Um, and so I was exposed to other, I, other people, other ideas, um, not just sort of, you know, my hometown. Uh, so that was great, you know, and, and being able to, I, was, I studied philosophy um, as a major in college uh, and creative writing. And um, I moved to Seattle to be involved in the writing scene in, in music. Um, and that was um, encouraged. And so, I, you know, I'm lucky for that. Uh, um, and, and how long have you been in Seattle now? And what brought you to Seattle to cover music as opposed to New York or L.A. or maybe even Nashville or any other vibrant music community? Yeah, um, uh, uh, I, I moved to Seattle in 2007. It was actually the weekend of folk life. So I, I always nice. sort of remember walking around folk life, trying to sort of figure out where I was. Um, I, uh, I worked for a, like a sort of small, maybe, you know, regional newspaper in New Jersey after graduating college at Rutgers, uh, which is also in New Jersey. It's like the state school um, in New Jersey where I studied philosophy and writing. Um, and I moved to Seattle because a friend of mine uh, had moved out here and he... Uh, I don't know how he did it, but he met some uh, good musicians, pe people who I've later played with. And he would send me these tracks of like these local musicians. And I was like, oh my God, these are people you know, this is amazing. 
Um, and so that attracted me because it seemed like Seattle was a place where you could meet the people who were, you know, exquisitely talented and, and, and have coffee with them or have a beer with them at night and sort of and enjoy their company. Whereas growing up in the East Coast, um, in New York or Philadelphia, it, it never seemed to me at the time that I could uh, find a foothold there, find my way in. Um, and so Seattle seemed like a city where I could do that. And um, I, I drove across country under the guise of um, visiting graduate schools, which I did. I went to you know University of Michigan and various other schools along the way, checking out their graduate writing programs. But um, sort of knew in my heart of hearts that I was going to land in Seattle and probably stay here for a little while. And it's turned into 12 years. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah I, I feel the exact yeah. same about it. It really is a community here and that what you were saying about being able to, if you really like what someone does, you're likely to you just maybe bump into them or if you reach out, they're pretty receptive to hanging out yeah. and talking with you about whatever. They're um, around, yeah. Yeah. So despite being a transplant to Seattle, you've written a lot about uh, Seattle culture. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, I've found a few books you've done, 100 Things to Do in Seattle Before You Die, <laughs> Unique Eats and Eateries of Seattle. And then coming next year, you have Northwest Know How Beer. Um, mm -hmm. This is somewhat of an obtuse question, but tell me how do you – is it weird to approach books where you're writing about something so locally based as someone not from here? And you've been here 12 years, so you've seen some changing dynamics of Seattle just in your time. But obviously, there's a lot of history before you. Um, and I'm sure you kind of want to capture that in your books. Yeah, it's just sort of like, how does a transplant write about some place that he's not sort of born and raised in? Um, I, yeah, it, yeah, in essence. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's, so there's, there's always reasons not to do something, you know, so I could make a story in my head, like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not from here. I'm not, you know, I, my parents aren't from here or whatever. So maybe I shouldn't, you know, feel um, the, the position to do it. And, and, you know, that's, that's fine. If someone, you know, comes to that conclusion, um, I, I was asked to write those books. The first two, you said, um, uh, I was put in contact with a publisher. Um, I was very grateful to be put in contact with that person. And they asked to, to do the first book. Which was which is what I wanted to do with uh, the unique eats and eateries because I, I like restaurants and I like going out to eat and I like food. Um, and then halfway through that, they asked if I would do the hundred things to do in Seattle, and I, I agreed to do that as well. Um, I wanted to do those books. I want I want to write books. Um, I've I've written three, um, and I would like to write many more. Uh, um, so I wanted to practice. Those were the first two I did, and I wanted to practice to be able to do it. Um, in, in terms of like having the confidence, like I've 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 written a lot about Seattle and um, in in publications around town from the Seattle Times, the Seattle Weekly, a stranger and things like that. So I felt I had, you know, I, I've had articles about restaurants and, and chefs and all those things out already. So it, I wasn't going into it blind or with no experience or without um, having an audience, I guess, sort of like be receptive or uh, already sort of engaged, I guess. Um, so there was that already. And if I hadn't done that, maybe I wouldn't have felt as confident to do it. But I, I guess the fact that I could could write down a hundred things and come up with, I think it was 90 restaurants for the other book. The fact that I could do that and do it with some sort of skill and clarity, I thought that, well, I must be in a position to be able to write these. Um, and I was the beer columnist for the Seattle Weekly for a couple of years, um, which is how um, I, I sort of landed that other book. And so that makes I've written about sense. beer and stuff, yeah. Did you had the credibility and experience of already covering all those things. You didn't need to disguise yourself as like, oh, I yeah, I'm a local, so I know all this, but yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. You, are are you there any locals in Seattle? I, I say it's, it's a joke. pretty my rare. Wife's a, my, yeah. my wife was born here, but um, but yeah. Cool. Uh, well, I have a few questions about the process, uh, especially in conducting interviews, kind of from writing the interview to writing to publication. Um, there's a lot of big name artists you've talked to recently. I saw their Lady Gaga, Patti Smith, Cindy Lauper. There's so many more. Um, I'm curious with popular acts in particular, are there any obstacles you have to overcome when talking to these people? I'm sure. They're, they're doing the interview because there's a plug you want hit. But after hitting the plug, are you basically able to ask them and publish anything you want? Or does that need to go through maybe an artist agent or a publisher for um, a publication, like an editor at a publication you're working for? Yeah, the short question. Yeah, are there any obstacles you have to or hurdles you have to go through in doing those interviews? Um. I mean, yeah, it's work. So there, there's things to do and things to sort of do well. Um, the probably the biggest obstacle is, is to is to build a career. You know, it, like I don't <laughs> right. I don't think that, um, to 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 interview Patty Smith, for example. You know, you have to have a little bit of credibility, you know, and, and experience with other publications. You also have to have a publication that will publish the interview that you have a rapport with um, that will you know accept the pitch and that you can use 
that publication um, is part of the pitch to the artist. So there, there's that hurdle, finding a home for the piece. Um, certainly there's the hurdle of, of feeling comfortable with someone over the phone, uh, asking sort of intimate questions potentially. And also, you know, maybe like I've done interviews with people that I've been nervous for. It, it happens less and less now, which I'm grateful for, but where I've, where I've been nervous and probably didn't do you know, an A plus job because I, I felt a little starstruck. Brit, Brittany Howard was one. I talked with her maybe a, a year, year and a half ago. Richard Sherman was another one. Um, and that, those were a little bit earlier in my career, especially Richard Sherman, but, um, but it still does happen. I mean, if you have admiration and respect for somebody, like it may still happen um, being starstruck here and there. But, uh, you know, I think, I think um, if you want to sort of be an, like a long-term interviewer, the people you talk to, you should have a, a real reason for doing it. And sort of, they should sound a little like woo woo or hippy dippy, but they should live in you in some way. There should be some sort of personal connection to this person or this person's work and if there is then it, it shouldn't be too daunting to speak with them because it's already sort of of you if that makes sense um uh and that's what i try to think about like with patty smith like obviously she has a, a great reputation people a lot of people know her um but i read a book about her sort of just um one of those 33 and a third album books oh, yeah. uh just for fun and so um i had a personal connection to her and her work so there was a, a point uh, like a, a foundation, a beginning to establish from the, for the interview. And then as you do research, like uh, I was, I listened to the, for that interview in particular, like it was about three albums that she'd done with this group recently. And so I listened to the albums like a great deal and tried to pick up themes and tried to uh, pick up ideas that she might be receptive to. And then you read the Wikipedia page and you do some research and, and in, in the research um, with Patty, uh, I found out she did a theme song, a, thong, a, a, a song for uh, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, which is one of my favorite cartoons of all time. It's an Adult Swim, really surreal, kind of out there cartoon. And I, this is it's like amazing that those two things collided. And so I brought that up halfway through the interview, and we became like best friends in that moment. Like she let she, her guard went down. Like when that conversation started, she was like, "How can I help you?" And it was like the most sort of sterile opening. And then halfway through, it just turned into this like oh my God, we're friends. Like we recognize the same sort of uh, great things in these like weird areas in just in this, you know, uh, one cartoon, but the formality of the interview at its beginning that was broken through a really personal common interest. And so having that friendship energy sort of a after the fact, like it, it makes for a much better conversation, which is what these really are or should be, and at least in my mind and in my work. Um, so you, that's what you look for, you know, and I've been doing this for a decade now so that I sort of know to look for those things and, and to try to lean into them when possible. You can't manufacture them, but you hope you, hope you find it. Um, so there are, you know, there are hurdles to, to doing the job. Um, and the greatest hurdle of all is finding your own perspective, I think, really. Right. When you're talking to someone like Patti Smith, who you may admire, um, yeah, the questions you're asking, you it, it sounds like you're kind of asking questions that you, you want to know the answer to. It doesn't necessarily have to be for a big audience if, if you're interested in what she has to say about a particular thing. Like, mo mo it, I don't even know if it was from your mindset that, like, I have to ask about Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Because I'm sure she's been asked about horses or Easter, those albums, so many times. So if you can yeah. find that niche thing that she yeah. hasn't been asked about a million times, and yeah, you probably that, you are likely to break through into that. Yeah, and it's especially if you have your own personal connection to it. Like, I didn't bring up Aqua Teen Hunger Force because it's weird. I brought it up because that's, like, one of my, like, five favorite shows of all time. Like, I found that show at, a, like, sort of a dark moment in my life, and it provided sort of, a, a, like, a, a calm and a bomb uh, to me at that time. So I have a very personal connection to that show. So that she, that, that she had the possibility to also create the, the opening for, like, a really great connection. Um, so the difficulty of the interview is there but you can break it if you find the right, you know, if you find the right moment and th that takes, you know, an ear for it experience, um, the right research and, and just sort of the sort of open heartedness to, to try to make friends with somebody, you know, in a way, you know, I don't want, I'm not trying to um, cast somebody in a, in an incorrect light, but I'm trying to find the, their best side. And usually their best side is going to be their like collaborative side or their open hearted side. And that, that's what I'm trying to sort of find, I think. Right, totally. Like, yeah, all, all the writing I've found from you so far, it's all been pretty positive press. You're not doing hit pieces on artists, you know. Um, but even though you don't write ne really negative press on people, I'm curious, do you, do you think there's value to negative press on artistic expression? 
Um, in general, sure, I'm, I, it should it should exist, I guess. Um, uh, I think about that. You know, I, I if if I'm speaking to somebody, and the conversation goes well, I want to describe in the piece that what it feels like to have a good conversation with that person and, and the sort of attributes and reasons why the conversation went well. Um, I, I, I have no desire to write uh, shitty things about people. Um, I don't, I think there's too much of that. There's too much reason to go negative, especially on the internet. You know, there's too many, too much criticism, not enough solution. Um, so I, I don't know, it's, I'm not, I'm like completely uninterested in it. And um, it could seem like uh, there's like a puff piece or puff attitude towards it. And, you know, if people find, feel that way, then, you know, so be it and don't read my shit. Uh, but I'm not interested in that, you know, just as, a, you know, if I'm having a conversation, I just as this conversation, I don't want to start asking you about your worst days, you know, maybe it'll get there through like a, a really <laughs> sort of a generous avenue. But, I, you know, I don't, or like ask you, you know, say why, why certain parts of the conversation were awful. Like, I don't know what, what's the point. Um, I, I yeah. see, like if, if an if album, the guest like if the Rolling Stones release a record, if the Rolling Stones release a record and it, like, it's terrible, then, you know, you might say, I might say this doesn't live up to certain expectations or I might, or I might not write about it. Or I might, you know, ask um, if I was to interview Keith Richards or whatever and be like, what did you think about the reception to this record? And so there's ways to talk about, failings um but th but to do it with a negative stance or like an intention to uh, to like remove the legs or undercut somebody i i just, I just think I, I um i think that's um improper focus and i think that's uh trying to exercise your own um either ego or your own you know desire for sort of just being a shithead although you know but uh but but for like politicians that different like people who are setting policy for for people of all different sort of socioeconomic systems or like the police or like things that are like entities that are working for the public and being paid by the public. They, the public des deserves to criticize and hear responses, but um, I don't need to, you know, criticize the new Tane and Paula album if I, if I hate it, cause I'd much rather write about things that I like, you know, no, I don't want to, I don't want to consume myself with that feeling and that energy. Like I, it's just like, it's grotesque to me. You know, especially if you're interviewing Person. someone and you yeah. approach them with a, that somewhat ne negative energy, they're going to get on the defensive and probably give you uh, the answers that aren't as insightful. If an artist, you happen to call them on a day they're already down and they start to volunteer that themselves, then you can fit, you can ask them. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can kind of ask questions to kind of fit in the mood they're already in, but to try to bring them down if they're excited to talk to you and then you bring them down, that, yeah, that'd be kind of shitty to do. Yeah, there are tricks, you know, like... If, if, if someone were like, if I was working for Rolling Stone or some other magazine and they were like, I want you to interview um, Kid Rock or something like that, I would, I would say, okay, you know, this is a magazine assigning me to someone who's like a big name. Sure, great. And I would say, hey, Kid Rock, you know, there, there's been criticism for, you know, the way you talk about certain people. Like, you know, what motivates you to talk about people that way or what was your response to that criticism? Um, and that's a that's a legit question. Um, if I'm being assigned to this interview and this is this is this person's position, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write about Kid Rock and be like, you know, "Ba with the Ba" is the best song of all time. Um, <laughs> right. But I'm not I'm not gonna like schedule my own interview with Patti Smith to be like, you know what? I the fourth song on your third record was a piece of shit. What were you thinking? Like that's just that's a negative. That's just sort of your own negative energy. You're just sort of superimposing onto somebody. Right. Uh, well, in addition to all these big name guests you're talking to, you do a lot of, uh, yeah, kind of work with independent artists, many of whom are local to our Seattle uh, area. Um, and because you do kind of, yeah, we're, we're trying to like spotlight the Seattle music industry here. And there are a lot of these kind of small musicians looking to get nice press. Um, what can indie, as someone who writes about a lot of musicians, what can these smaller musicians looking for press, what can they do to help their chances of getting written about if they're reaching out to you? Do you see mistakes that people make and maybe a pitch or is there, is their press kit bad because of these reasons? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's very useful. Uh, so the, the biggest thing anybody can learn who's trying to get, you know, written about or trying to get attention is that it's not about the, if the music is good or not, because there's 10,000 good musicians in Seattle. There's 20,000, maybe half a million. I don't know. There, there's a lot of good musicians in Seattle who are very capable of, playing a bass line, a guitar solo, a drum fill, whatever. It's about the story. 
So if, if, an, if, an, if a writer is going to write about you, that writer is going to write a story about you. So what is the story? So Band X has done what? Band X, you know, is inspired by what? Uh, the people in Band X have, uh, you know, how do they meet? You know, what is the story? You know, you're asking someone to write a story about you. So if there aren't, you know, sort of points of interest for the story, there's nothing to write about. It has nothing to do with whether or not your song, you know, was moving necessarily. It's about what, it's, is there material there for a writer to write about? And is that material worth reading? Is there an audience for that story? Um, so those are the sort of, that's like the big picture. So when people are like, hey, will you write about me? Like, they need to think about that first. Um, and then, you know, the rest is fine, you know, and this sort of guess goes hand in hand, but it's finding your voice and finding your, you know, what's interesting and, and what your perspective is. Because again, there's a lot of good musicians, but what are you saying? What are you adding? You know, if, if you sound exactly like Miles Davis, you know what? We have Miles Davis. If you sound exactly like Thunder Pussy, you know what? We have Thunder Pussy. Pearl Jam, we have Pearl Jam. Is there something that's different? Um, and, uh, you know, as sort of my wife says, Eva, who's a musician with the Black Tones, um, uh, you know, embrace your weird and take a risk. Um, can you do those things? Are you capable of doing those things? Um, Cause that's the stuff that uh, makes for the best story. So that onus of responsibility and kind of pitching your story that that's more on the artist. And if you can present that, the interviewer can draw more on that, but it's the artist's responsibility to really put that information out there. Is that right? I don't know who's responsible. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I sort of the responsibility. I don't know. I mean, I'm nobody's boss. Um, <laughs> sure. But- if, if you're an artist trying to get press and try to get, trying to get press and try to get, you know, in contact with somebody and you don't give them reasons to do so beyond we're really good. Um, I don't know. What, what do you expect anybody to sort of, it's like, if you're dating somebody, you're just like, hi, I'm awesome. It's like, okay, well, I don't, you know, what, I, why, because you say you're awesome. I'm going to date you now. Like, no, like tell a story with yourself, present what's interesting, present your pers- 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 perspective. Like why would anybody want to sort of engage with you other than you're good? You know, like, eh, it doesn't mean anything. Well, what's so I don't know about responsibility. Like, I'm not going to, you know, I don't, I don't want to dabble in that word. But, but, uh, but if you want to help yourself, you want to present yourself in the best light. Well, what's your considera- consideration process when you decide uh, this is something I want to write about or this is something I don't? I'm sure you're doing an equal amount of you reaching out to people and some people reaching out to you. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there is like a set way. I don't like have a like a top 10 checklist of like, did it hit one through 10 in the right order? Um, you know, and it depends on the day, it depends what I'm interested in, it depends what I heard yesterday, it depends what, you know, what's going on in my life, because I'm a human being. Um, if, but if it's interesting, if there are things that I that looks like, you know, that I can write about, or that I can ask questions about, you know, like, how about like, you chose to interview me because maybe you've seen, you know, like you said, some big name people or because I write about stuff in Seattle, like there are reasons to interview me in your mind. Um, and if, if those, if I was just like, hi, interview me, like I'm a really good writer. And you were like, oh, I've never seen any good writing. I don't know what you like. I, there's, there's nothing to hook into. There's no, there's no points of engagement, points of interest, like, and there's no set way to do that. You know, there's, there really isn't. Um, I guess things I look for, you know, have you been, played in other places. Um, what does your art look like? What does your band look like? Um, you know, uh, how, how, how eloquent or articulate or just sort of clear is your, is your email? Uh, what does your subject line say? Like all these, you just sort of tell somebody's energy by all the things they put out in the world. And if it's lazy or if it's convoluted or if there's, if it's, you know, 10,000 words when it could be a hundred, um, you know, they got to go back to the drawing board, or at least I don't have the bandwidth of the time to do it, you know, because I'd love to write about everybody. I would love to give equal time to everybody. But, you know, I have 40 to 80 hours a week where I can spend doing it. And I have some level of responsibility to my sanity and my, my, my life to, <laughs> to do it. Um, and I would also say, and if anybody's still listening, uh, don't ask people for like, you know, give me, it's like, don't ask a writer or a DJ for their, for feedback. Like, it's like, no one's got time for that shit. Like, <laughs> ask your family members or your friends like i don't know that's or, that's a or little, google little... there's it, yeah a plethora of resources that can tell you what what you should do or like it just advice for creative people it, yeah if you're going to yeah a, a dj or a writer for a review if you're looking to get press you can even but just for feedback i yeah that's a waste of everybody's time it's and it's it's like rude you know it's like hey person who i whose work i respect can you give me like you know two hours of your time and give me a hundred percent feedback and we've never met before. Like it's just, um, 
it's, it's why like, I'm so it's thankful. It's like proposing that, stealing. Yeah. yeah, it's why I'm so thankful that when I do ask my friends or family for feedback on something I'm recording, because when you're in the process of writing a song, you can get so in your head, you've heard something over a hundred times and you've just lost all objective truth if something's good or yeah, not. Yeah, you need feedback. Yeah, but it's just yeah. like, don't ask a stranger whose job it is professionally to write or give feedback to, to do it for free if you've never met them before. It just It's just uh, uh, rude, I think. Right. But what I like is that with music, I'm, I may have a three or four minute song. So if I do ask someone for feedback, I don't feel too guilty right. about it just from family or friends where it's like, if I was a movie director and I would send, oh, here's a three and a half hour movie I made. What, what's your feedback on it? <laughs> and then asking someone for feedback on something. Yeah. It's like, geez, I don't have time it's, for that. Yeah. If you're not friend, if you don't have a personal relationship with them, then it's, you're asking mm -hmm. for something very personal and, and uh, yeah. Seems yeah, misguided. Uh, well, one of the publications you write for, American Songwriter, you seem to have a recurring feature there with called Five to Discover. How do you discover new music generally? Um, uh, I'm lucky enough at this point to, I, you know, I wake up to 50 press releases every day um, mm. that has new music and, you know, things coming out. Um, so I, I have a sort of robust uh, number to choose from. Uh, I'm also on social media regularly and I sort of see um, who, who friends are sharing, who friends are listening to, um, who's going on tour, who has new releases. And they, you know, I don't, I don't catch every fly in my web, so to speak, but um, I, I do the best that I can um, to come up with at least five a week for that uh, column. Um, and that's fun, you know, like it's fun to be able to get on the ground floor with the band or to, to give the band that first bit of press. So, you know, American Songwriter has a pretty good reputation um, so it's nice for them to get a press quote out of American Songwriter. And I like being able to offer that to bands that I think are um, starting off on the right foot. Totally. Well, a few hours after we taped this, um, season two of Video Bebop premieres. Uh, congrats yes. on getting a second season. Thank you. First, can you uh, briefly explain what Video Bebop is, why you wanted to create it? And then, um, yeah, what you guys are doing in the second second season? What do you want to do? Maybe if it's different at all from the first, I don't know. Yeah, um, Video Bebop is a music video show on the Seattle channel um, that, uh, yeah, we display music videos, Pacific Northwest uh, music videos. Um, so, you know, all around Vancouver, BC, Seattle, Portland, and then it can stretch to maybe Montana, Idaho, other places. Um, oftentimes they're mostly Seattle and Portland though, because that's where a lot of the bands are and that's where the, a lot of the submissions we, are, uh, we get are from. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I've written a lot about music in Seattle and I would get a lot of emails saying, hey, can you sort of premiere our music video on, um, you know, Artist Home or some other publication? And it's really hard to premiere a music video or like it's sort of clunky because um, you, you have to ask the person to sort of make the YouTube link go live at a certain time. And uh, that can get sort of clunky because they don't want to make it live if it's not being premiered. And it's just like, there's, it's just a lot of weird little tiny steps. Um, so I turned to my wife, um, who was my fiance at the time. And I said, why don't we create a TV show, um, with music videos? And, um, she thought it was a great idea, which was a good sign. And, um, so we, we took the idea first to, um, channel 11, uh, KBCS, uh, channel Sounds 11, right. uh, the, I'm, I'm sorry, the call letters are esca escaping me. And we got down the road pretty far with them, um, but it didn't work out in the end. And then so we took it to the Seattle channel, which was great. And um, they gave us uh, more sort of creative control. Um, and we do it, yeah, so it's me, um, Eva Walker, my wife, um, Cedric, uh, her twin brother, who's, who's the drummer in the Black Tones, um, Alia from Trace Light Chase, and Danny, um, Danny Denial, who's amazing, um, who I call Seattle jo Seattle's John Waters. Um, and uh, we put together generally five music videos in each half hour show. We premiere a new show once a month on the second Saturday of each month. And then um, Seattle Channel is nice enough to rerun it almost every day. Um, and we just started a new thing called uh, Video Bebop Presents where we put uh, the Smokey Brights live record release uh, that was at the Tractor Tavern. We debuted that um, on Thursday, the October 8th. I don't know when this is gonna run, but that's when it was. And so it's cool, we get to sort of showcase videos um on uh tv which is great you know we're all sort of children of mtv in a way and so it's nice to get back to that and it's nice to have a presence on the seattle channel that's fantastic um well let's go back to the patty smith interview we were touching on earlier um i read through that and i liked that at one point you just kind of asked her what do you want to talk about she's been interviewed yeah. a lot of times she's 
done a, yeah has a lot to say uh yeah so at this point what do you want to talk about what's on your mind uh is there anything oh. new you're working on right now you're excited about oh, i know you you play music we haven't talked about that yet um yeah uh uh what's on my mind what am i working on um well when when we conclude this interview i will be going to uh be listening to a bunch of records for you know future interviews this week um i don't remember who i've who's coming up this week. It's usually a couple people a day I generally interview. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, recent great ones were the guitarist Her, um, I, I, uh, and like you said, Patti Smith. Um, what else? I don't know, man. That's a good question. What am I working on? Uh, I just finished that beer book that, that, went, that went in the can. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, the, my, the honest question now that I think about it would be, I'm trying to work on not working so much. Um, oh, yeah? And, yeah, a little bit, although I probably won't succeed at that. Um, Work is one of the you know really great avenues that I found during quarantine because it's productive. I'm very very lucky to have work and to have a job, um, uh, to have money come in and things like that. But um, I can get really really severe tunnel vision, um, and I need to make sure that I don't do that. And I think quarantine is sort of conducive to that, and I need to make sure that I'm allowing space um, that's not sort of so forward, but I'm allowing sort of side space and sort of. 360 space from my psyche so that I can, uh, because my heart will still work uh, 10 years from now. <laughs> and, and what so, does that involve? Do you go outside to outdoorsy things or what, what clears your mind? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know what clears, uh, this, this morning, you know, me and Eva, we went to our friend, um, Julia Massey and Jared Cortez, their oh, husband yeah. and wife, and they play in Warren Dunes. We, we went to their place, um, just to have coffee outside and their little son Carl was running around and it took a little while for it, for, uh, the, the hardened skin of, of, of nonstop work to sort of start to crumble off. But, um, it slowly did after, you know, an hour or two there. And that felt really good to talk with other people who, um, are married, who are creative, who share, um, uh, the, who share a living space uh, that is both for their, you know, romantic life through their partnership and through their creative life and through their um, professional life. And so that's what sort of all, all the people who are, you know, with par- their partners and family in, in their house, that's what they're doing. So many of us. Um, and that's, that can be fucking daunting at times or just repetitive and, and work included. Um, so I need to make sure that I, I uh, don't do that as much. Although it's hard, you know, because you balance that with the other side. It's like, yeah, Lady Gaga interview, that's awesome. Patti Smith, that's awesome. Like the career is doing okay. And you, you want to sort of keep those irons in that fire. So it's, it's a really nuanced balance um, while simultaneously there's toxic smoke in the air and there's much needed protests happening in the street that affect my family. Um, right. it, there's a lot of things happening. Uh, so... Um, it's, it's hard and, and, you know, I'm not, certainly not the only one. I'm probably one of everybody who's trying to find the right balance, um, through creative, through joy, through work, and through also, you know, trying to maintain an open brain a little bit. It's hard. Yeah. Totally. But when you say like the, yeah, the Lady Gaga and Patti Smith interviews went great, you've been doing this for like a decade now, I think you said, uh, do you have metrics to kind of judge if a piece of writing is successful for you or not? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's a feeling, uh, and that's, mm-hmm. a, that's an idea I'm leaning into more and more is, is a, the idea of the importance of a good feeling. Um, I think, you know, really great interviews that I'm very proud of. I usually go like this afterwards once it's all, <laughs> once it's all done and I've hung up the phone and, and I've made sure on my little app on my phone that it's recorded. And that feels really good. Um, and because, because I don't really know why, because it's maybe innate, um, I just like that more than, you know, making a great meal. You know, it's just what I like to do. Um, and if you, if it feels like we, me and the other person have exchanged something valuable um, in an interpersonal way, it doesn't have to be like, you know, a tip or anything money making, but just something like, Oh wow. Like we, we found a little humanity in one another and we were able to um, trust one another and to sort of be a little vulnerable, be a little intimate in, in conversation. Right. And so that's, that's very valuable. And then, you know, if a piece I write after that is effective or if it gets a lot of traffic or, you know, if someone compliments it or if the artist shares it and sounds um, appreciative of it, those are all sort of other metrics um, secondarily um, that I that make me happy. But um, it's a feeling and, and that's why I do it. everything else, you know, the payment, the, the publishing, you know, everything else is sort of secondary, tertiary, you know, 
uh, more than just a feeling of conversation. And I think that's, if anything, that's the compass I need to sort of follow to these days is like um, productive, you know, humanizing conversation. I'm glad to hear that it just comes down to the feeling because I'm pretty new at this. You're only the eighth interview I'm doing for this podcast, but the ones that I felt like have gone the best so far, it doesn't necessarily mean they'll be the one with the most views on the, on the videos after they come out. But if I feel like I made some kind of connection, that's nice. Um, now my last question before we get to show and tell is a somewhat selfish one because I am new at this and you've been doing this for a long time. What do you, do you have recommendations for interviewers? I somewhat struggling with, um, I, I want the, I want the conversations to be about the guests, but I don't want to just be someone asking them questions on a piece of paper like I have here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't want every time after you give an answer or any guest I'm talking to, to just put my own point of view on what they're saying. So it, finding the balance between talking, ma- ma- making it a back and forth, but keeping the focus on the guests is one goal. Do you have other things you like to do? Or advice for interviewers? Yeah, I mean, generally read, just read. Um, uh, if that, you know, uh, or listen, I guess, you know, this is a podcast or a video show, you know, I would, I would do, listen to podcasts, listen to video shows, because um, you can glean things from those shows, even though you're not trying to, you know, mimic them or copy them. Um, so take in the media that you want to put out and to, you know, find the best versions of that is important. Um, I think reading in general is good and, you know, and actually writing is good, even if you're not a, um, a writer or, you know, a novelist or an author, because uh, clear communication is like the most important thing in the world uh, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, we have this, you know, information abounds, all that stuff is everywhere, but, but being clear, being concise, being able, being communicative, all of those things are really, really important skills, especially in my mind, you know, I, I don't, I am terrible with technology. I, I am not good with, with most things. Um, but I've doubled down on trying to sort of distill my ability to um, communicate and to be clear and to have a vocabulary and to be able to listen and also um, reciprocate. Uh, so as an interviewer, I think I value those skills. So maybe you'll, maybe hearing me say them, you'll value them as well. Um, and then the other thing is just be interested in people. You know, if, if, if this is an interview show with people, you know, I, ideally you're interested in people and, and, and maybe take into consideration the sort of thing that I said about find out where these people live in you, you know, uh, um, right. be, you know, it's where, do the, you know, what about, you know, sort of my story or, or just sort of my writing really touched you and really investigate that in your own self, you know, and, and try to unpack that feeling and, and why is it interesting. And, you know, maybe, you know, try to find all the sort of tendrils and tentacles of, of why that's interesting to you and, and then write questions based on that. Cause I think your, your, your uh, subject will respond uh, best that way. And that will make for the most compelling piece, which will build your career and reputation and allow you to uh, interview people who are way more important than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I did want to interview for a reason. I, my, myself as a creative person, I, I, I've been interviewed many times asking about music and you get a lot of the, I've, so when, when I talk to musicians, I kind of know, like, I'm sure they've gotten this question a bunch because I've gotten that question a bunch. And with this podcast, it's been nice talking to other people, a, a lot of people in the Seattle music scene who aren't just musicians, uh, j- journalists, that's something I've never really done before. So there's a natural curiosity where I have an interest. I've like done little writings and short stories myself, but I've never published them. So yeah, it's cool to talk to somebody who does that at a professional level and kind of get their insight from amateur to professional level. Uh, but anyway, let's get into uh, your show yeah. and tell. You have a couple okay. of, or a, a thing or two you're deciding. I do. Between. The problem is um, the, one of the things I wanted to show is the thing that my phone is on right now and the thing that is allowing me to have this camera positioning. So I, I'm... Uh, I'm averse to removing that situation. So I'll, I'll show you the, the more primary thing. If you give yeah. me just uh, three seconds. Sure. All right. All right. I'm excited. And that is three boxes of basketball cards beginning from... <laughs> 1989-90 hoops with Larry Bird and Carl Malone. Wow. To 90-91 with Hakeem Olajuwon and Patrick Ewing, Skybox. 
92, 93 with apparently nobody except for a basketball. Maybe they couldn't get the rights to anybody, but um, <laughs> basketball cards, man, and just full of packs and packs and packs of basketball cards. I grew up uh, just – this is open, right? Yeah, packs and packs and packs. There's, I probably have 100 of these just right next to me in these boxes I showed you. Grew up very – actually, this is a perfect thing to talk about. Um, I grew up very interested um, – in basketball cards, I, I played basketball uh, ever since I was about, you know, eight, nine, ten, all the way through my senior year of high school. I was on the team in high school, and um, I collected the cards. And I remember uh, putting, you know, the little like the Michael Jordan in the little sleeve in the pages right. in this fucking binder, and um, and I, you know, before that, I collected like superhero figures and uh, you know action figures and things like that. And it's so interesting, actually, to me thinking about that uh, habit that I had when I was younger and that really that love for these personalities and these traits because mm. um, these basketball players, for example, Patrick Ewing, he has, you know, to a kid, superpowers. Um, right. Michael Jordan, of course, um, people like that, you know, Derek Jeter as a baseball player, Joe Montana, whatever. These, these people have, you know, extra human powers, it seems like when you're a child of athletics, of sort of stardom. Um, and it's interesting that I had such a passion for those things. It's interesting to me anyway, that I had such a passion for those things because that's what I do now. I, I, I collect these interviews. If you go to my website, it has you know, page after page, you know, slide after slide of, pers of people, which is a lot like these sort of basketball cards that I used to collect. And I'm sort of collecting these interviews. And now, now as an adult, because I've developed certain skills or certain habits or just spent a lot of time doing something, um, the basketball cards I'm sort of collecting are these uh, engaging conversations with mm. people who I admire and I respect who have these sort of powers that I, that I also, sort of, as an adult, as someone who cares about art, um, that I sort of see in them. So I get to see these powers in them and I get to ask them questions about the decisions it took to, to strengthen and hone those powers. And those conversations I get to publish and I get to slide them into my, my website <laughs> to uh, like, like I did when I was 11 collecting Michael Jordan cards. So, there's my show and tell, and it's a perfect sort of seamless, uh, um, I don't know, microcosm. Yeah, so so that collection you showed me, is that all from like childhood or did the collection, or like oh, did you build the collection in later life too? Yeah, so I, when I was a kid, I would go to like the card store and buy a pack with the $2 that my, you know, my mom gave me or something right. or I got from some chores or something. These, these are me indulging my, my child side uh, where with money I have now, I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to buy a fucking box of cards. It started um, two Christmases ago. Um, Eva was asking what I want for Christmas. And I said, a box of basketball cards, because it's like a lot of little presents to open. And it's right. nostalgic. And it reminds me, reminds me of childhood. And, and it, it satisfies or scratches the itch of the sort of collecting and sort of appreciating of these people with these powers. Um, and so it sort of harkens back to that and reminds me of what it was like on different Christmas mornings when I would get cards or just sort of fun moments in my life. Um, and so th these, I bought all those, so, you know, within the last year or two or some, I think one or two of them were Christmas presents from Eva. I have another box in some corner over here that I didn't bring out. Um, so these are all more recent, but, um, it, it harkens back to something I did for many years is when I was younger. And th all those cards are at my mom, in my mom's basement somewhere in outside of Boston, Massachusetts. So is, is there like a Holy grail card you're after? Do you have everything you want? Or is there one like, this is the card I need? I, I, I collected Pokemon cards. Yeah. That was the only like card collection I have. And I know there'd be different variants. There'd be like the English yeah. version of the card and the Japanese, or maybe one is holographic and one isn't. Is there yeah. that kind of card diversity or is there a card you really, really want? So the thing you just did there is a good, good interview technique where you ask the question and you, then you relate it immediately to your own personal experience. Mm. It gives me a context with which not, I'm not only answering a question, I also have a guide of your own personality. It creates a cool, better context. So that's oh, a good trick. You. So you did a good job there. Um, the answer is no and yes. You know, I would love to have a Michael Jordan rookie because that's like worth $5,000, but I'm not oh, like, shit. My, my, my sort of day-to-day -day life isn't sort of built around finding it. I don't have any sort of uh, delusions that I'm going to, but if you happen to have a listener out there who has a Michael Jordan rookie that wants to mail it my way, Let's put it out I, there. we can yeah. facilitate it, yeah. Um, and then is there any, I like with old action figures, some people like you have to keep it inside the box and you, you're taking all the cards out. They don't need to stay in packs or... The, the, no, the, the goal is to show it off, right? Not, no, not to, the goal is to get the cards and to open them. And then yeah. after that, it doesn't matter. Um, when I was a kid, it was like, you know, I had all these little holders and cases and I have like, you know, rookie cards that are worth a little bit of money and they're protected or so I think they are, even though I haven't seen them for 12 years since I moved out here. <laughs> right. Um, 
but th th this is this is for more indulging just sort of a personal like just sort of joy for a few moments a day opening these packs i i have no if they happen to be worth a thousand dollars you know like 10 years from now sure but that's not my aim i have i don't really care about that um for these no it's just mo more just to have um just a sort of like yeah there's a bit of there's a box of childhood over there in the corner that i of my own childhood that i can sort of enjoy and go back to but it's mostly just for, for the sort of um novelty of opening these packs or because they're like the boxes are like 50 bucks you know to buy a sure. one of these boxes some of them are expensive because they may have a more expensive card in the unopened packs but these are sort of the cheaper stuff and it's just to get something in the mail and just sort of open just for right. fun I super appreciate that hobby. I kind of started my own similar thing recently. It's a similar thing where I'm going back with the nostalgia. I all, I've been doing animation cell collecting. I just started this year where oh, cool. before cartoons were all digitally done and till like the, probably like the end of the nineties, every cartoon was cell painted. A lot of them yeah. in Korean. I've been going back and collect. I have a Rugrats animation cell and a Whoa. production drawing with what, that. What is, the, what is the picture? Like what is the cell? Oh, I'll, I'll grab it. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll run out and grab it. I have that one, cool. and then I have a one from SpongeBob SquarePants, one of my favorite cool. cartoons, and then uh, an anime called Yu Yu Hakusho, which is one of my favorite sure. shows growing up, and I did a rewatch recently. That was really good. But it is a similar thing where there's a novelty to it, and with the animation cells, I really liked that. Um, and there may be 20,000 frames in a cartoon, but I have the one cell that looks exactly yeah. like this. If their mouth is open in a weird way. The next cell in the animation is not going to look like that. Yeah. I'll grab the Rugrats one real quick. Hang on. Yeah. All right. So this is actually a few different layers. So it's framed right now, and I'll take it out of the frame. But um, yeah, oh, what wow. we've got here, we've got Tommy and Angelica in this, like, yeah. it's like an auto garage. And there's a few different layers of the animation. Yeah, I'll show I see you. the tires. Yeah, so the characters are on their own animation. And this tire they like swing from it so that's in its own separate layer and then there's a background let me just start disassembling this and i'll kind of show my, you and, my household is a very big rugrats household i oh, very yeah? much appreciate rugrats so yeah my uh the drummer he gave me this uh like blanket he had from childhood that it was a reptar blanket i don't know yeah. where it is right now but it was the coolest <laughs> one of my favorite gifts i've gotten all right somewhat messy here so let's just take this off top from bottom um and all of these they have so this first cell is just the tire oh so yeah it's like a it's like a number of cells on top of each other exactly and that um you yeah yeah and then the back you can see it's actually painted on there every one of these layers they have their own production notes it's really hard to see wow. because it's translucent but has like scene notes um Can, how, how much does one of those does a rugrat cell go for is it like below a thousand dollars right so different cartoons and different uh like spongebob only the first season was cell animated so those can be more more uh expensive i do have of them that can go 500 to over a thousand dollars i'm usually in the 50 to 100 dollar range yeah i'm still learning about it but there's something called key cells master cells and then and there, there's some other thing i think are the ones i'm getting uh yeah the tommy and angelica one tight and then a, just another and then i have a copy background which is not it's just like it's not the one they actually um oh i see yeah it's, it's not the one they used for the show it's like they did a paint and then just photocopied it. So that's what I have yeah. to kind of complete this here. And then cool. I've, been talk I've been talking too long here, but but I'll finish the thing where this is the, let me see if I can get in frame. That's the production drawing for the scene. Oh, cool. Which is cool because you have wow. some, uh, yeah, there's some kind of notes on here in Korean and some in English and all these instructions for the animators. Um, and there's a little Nickelodeon official seal down there everything's too bright cool. it's probably not showing up but yeah that, that's my baseball card uh, my basketball yeah, yeah, card yeah, collection totally. totally i man i love those doug and rugrats and oh man even ah real monsters and oh, rocco's modern life used to like make me feel queasy but um i even have respect for that show totally there was a new movie that came out with rocco recently yeah uh, i never saw I, it I, I didn't either i think there's supposed to be a hey arnold one too um hey i'm not awesome. sure 
It's so good. I have the first yeah. season on DVD, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to give the last word to you. Um, where can people go to find your work? If people want to get in touch, how can they do that? And any other plugs or shout outs you want to give? Um, yeah, they, you know, I have my own website, which I mentioned before, which is my name. It's uh, jakeuti.com, J-A-K-E-U-I-T-T-I.com. Um, uh, I don't know. The, the only, you know, the only call to action I would offer people is support music. Um, if you can, if you can afford it, uh, buy music, buy food from restaurants. If you can do, cause, cause if you buy restaurant, if you buy food from restaurants, you're probably supporting a musician as well. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, I worked in restaurants for many, many years and, and may still again one day, depending on how all this works out. Um, so, uh, support people when you can and, and, and be nice. <laughs> That's my plug. Well, Jake, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure talking to you today. Thanks Thank for your time. you. Yeah, it's it's um it's it's always very interesting to be on the other side of these, and um it doesn't happen all that often. So I'm flattered, and thank you for taking the time. Cool. All right, later, everyone. Peace.